Hello there. Thank you so much for um, stopping by, clicking on my presentation. Um, my name is Timothy Miller. I am a first year graduate student with the Department of Geological Sciences uh, here at Central Washington University. And I'm working on a master's thesis um, uh, that is uh, focused on investigating the physical and chemical evolution of gold in Liberty, Washington via microanalysis. So why study gold? Well, it's it's a very important mineral metal um, to our society. Um, we're developing um, medical applications of it and gold in the form of nanoparticles that are able to carry medicines um, to locations within our body. Um, it's utilized in basically every advanced electronic component we use. Um, so without it, I would not be able to give this presentation to you. You wouldn't be able to watch it. So it's a very important critical mineral to our society. Um, specifically, my research is focused on how was gold um, in the Liberty area first initially concentrated into hydrothermal fluids, which are hot fluids deep within the crust um, that uh, can carry a lot of elements within them. So that will be the first part, and then I'm, I'm curious as to uh, how does the gold um, mineralize or grow um, in the hard rocks of the area of Liberty, and then from that point, how do they weather out of those rocks, and how does their chemistry, the gold's chemistry, um, change uh, as it's weathered and uh, tumbled down into streams in the area. So why study Liberty's area? Um, besides its close location to Ellensburg, it's only 20 miles to the northwest from here. Um, it is a very excellent place to study this, um, these processes because it displays numerous different textures of gold. Um, it displays the uh, uh, in situ gold, um, the actual gold mineralization, um, and it also displays uh, plaster deposits, which are gold that have been weathered out and put into the streams. Uh, so a little history on Liberty area. Gold was first discovered there in 1868 along the banks of the Swak Creek. Um, miners, uh, being excellent finders of metals, realized that they could trace up these streams looking for the concentration of gold in them, um, knowing that there probably was a hard rock deposit of gold nearby. So they would pan up the, strings, the streams um, and eventually find where it ran out and realize there must be gold above here. And they did. They found these hard rock deposits in 1881 and since then have mined the area for the gold there. Um, mining is still carried out today on a smaller scale. But so my my field research began has begun in the Liberty area, and my focus has started on characterizing the geologic units in the area. So starting with the oldest, the oldest unit is the Swak sedimentary unit, which is um, a thick unit of sandstone, siltstones, mudstones. Um, and how these rocks are deposited is that um, essentially they are sediments carried in a river setting. And eventually when the river enters a, a lake setting, it slows down and it allows these particles of sediment to settle out and form these rock layers. Um, the sandstone represents more coarse versions of these sediments. The mudstones are finer um, versions of these sediments. So they really require a very slow water environment to settle out. Um, so cross-cutting these uh, the sedimentary unit is the Tianue Vulcanism or um, uh, Tianue Dyke Swarm, which is an igneous rock that has um, cut through these different units, and um, it is not it's not volcanic rock. It's not on the surface, right? In a volcano, it's kind of the pipework underneath the volcano, um, and so. Here you can see that frozen version of that rock there. Well, once these units are in place, um, rocks are able to be deformed in a number of different ways. So what we see here in D is an example of the mudstone, um, except now it's been brecciated. So that's basically our fancy geology term of saying it's been shattered, broken into pieces. And in between all these pieces are these, these white mineralization. So we call these veins. So, um, on the gold reserve mining claim, which is a claim that I'm doing a lot of my research on, it's represented here by this purple rectangle, um, there's an area on this claim that we've uh, called the cut. And um, you can see all of these geologic units here. Um, so the Swak Arco sandstone, um, the diabase, which is uh, that igneous rock, salt, um, 
and uh, as well, just off screen, there would be a, a, a deposit of the mudstone, and then here we can see that brecciated mudstone there. Um, so they're all within a cro close proximity of this fault that is running through um, the area there. And what faults do is they're essentially blocks of the earth, they represent blocks of the earth moving past each other, um, relieving stress within the crust. And when that happens, um, you can have shattering of the rock next to them. And so this could be a likely way that these cracks formed allowing accommodation space for mineral mineralization to come up and fill those cracks. So um, when that mineralization, when that hydrothermal fluid comes up, right, it can interact with these rocks and that chemical physical interaction with the rocks can help develop gold. So here we can see the different styles of gold we see in uh, Liberty. So this is an example of the primary in situ wire gold. So you can see it kind of growing out of the white mineralization there and around it are chunks of that kind of breccia broken um, swak sandstone um, and so as that deposit right that was originally in the hard rock begins to weather out due to forces of nature wind and water right gravity pulling it down um, they'll leave the mineralization and they'll show their kind of crystalline form you know that's hidden underside that inside of that mineralization and eventually as they enter you know continue down the hills and inevitably enter into streams they can become compacted and deformed um, and turn into you know the plaster nuggets that we're kind of more used to seeing in the bottom of gold pans well as they're you know weathered and transported the chemistry and crystallography of the gold can change. And that's, again, where my research comes in to measure these things using the analytical facilities at the Murdoch Research Laboratory, which is ran by my wonderful thesis advisor, Dr. Angela Halfpenny. Here's a nice little plug for the Murdoch Laboratory. Please come use our equipment. It's an excellent facility. So once I have these, or I have these samples, my goal is to prepare them into different forms. So I've had thin sections produced, which are essentially really thin cuts of rock that you're able to use on an optical microscope. And using that, I can kind of characterize the different minerals that are associated with the gold, um, as well as I'm going to do and have um, produced a uh, uh, epoxy molds um, or epoxy uh, pucks we call them that hold these gold nuggets within them and I can polish them and see the inside of the nuggets and if I polish it very well I'm actually able to use our scanning electron microscope to see um, measure analytically measure get quantitative numbers of the chemistry and crystallography within the gold um, and using these things I'll be able to essentially, using all this information, the analytical work along with my field work that I've been doing, um, I'll be able to develop kind of an overall genesis um, uh, of how gold in the Liberty area was initially concentrated into fluids, precipitated out, um, weathered, and how the gold nugget has, or how the gold has changed as it's been transported. Um, and this can tell me things about how far it's been transported. And, um, so. This is, this is my research as it is thus far. Um, it's, it's important to understand these deposits, um, these small scale gold deposits, because they can provide us a lot of insight to other critical mineral deposits, which are essential to our society. Um, and that's, that's my research thus far. Um, so thank you so much for sticking around, enjoying my talk, hopefully. I hope you learned something and have a wonderful rest of your day.